Hello everyone and welcome to another XCOM 2 challenge run here on my YouTube channel. So today we're answering a question that quite a few of you have been looking forward to. I have not been looking forward to it, but here we are. The time is upon us. Can you beat XCOM 2 War of the Chosen using only psionic operatives in combat? The usual plug here, I normally live stream these runs on Twitch and they are archived on my second YouTube channel so please check those out if you're interested. The links to both are in the description of this video. So where do I begin? If you've played XCOM 2 you're probably thinking this is a really easy run to do. I mean PsyOps are probably the strongest unit in the game once they're fully trained. They have devastating psychic or psionic abilities that can pretty much obliterate anything in their path. Well, let me tell you emphatically and unequivocally, you are wrong. Sometimes I get comments on my videos that these challenge runs aren't really challenging enough. Well, this one is going to be challenging. This one is going to be pain in its purest form. So if you like seeing a man punish himself mercilessly via a video game, stay tuned. This is the run for you. But before we get into why this run is so brutal, let's go over the rules. We're playing on Commander difficulty. We're playing on Honest Man, so we can only reload in the event of misclicks or glitches. And only Psy operatives are allowed in combat. So there's a few things to know about psionic operatives. The first is that they grow stronger in a totally different manner to every other class in the game. XP is useless to PsyOps. They have to be trained in a facility called the PsyLab. This training ranks them up and lets them learn new abilities. But without that PsyLab, when I add 12 of these guys into the game with the Starting Soldiers mod, well, they haven't had any PsyLab training. We don't have a PsyLab yet. That means they don't have any abilities. So until we have that facility built, this is essentially a rookies only run. And that facility is locked behind multiple levels of research, plus it costs supplies and Illyrium crystals to make. And Illyrium crystals are generally a late game item. They're not super easy to come by at the start. But even when we get the Scilab, Fully upgraded, it can only train a maximum of two soldiers at a time. And it takes months of training to get one of these troops to max level. So we'll still be fielding a team of mostly rookies in the meantime. Even if you send a PSYOP on a covert operation that has a promotion as a reward, it won't work. I mean, I believe it does level up the soldier and it increases their stats, but it won't teach them any new abilities. It's still just shoot and utility items. That's the extent of what they can do. And even if we can level one of these people to maximum, the GTS doesn't recognize their promotions, so we still won't be able to purchase squad size upgrades. It's really weird. Covert Ops will recognize their rank, so at least we can still hunt the Chosen. Eventually, not right away. But the GTS is a no-go. And I said these guys are like rookies, but the truth is, in some ways, they're actually worse than rookies. See, if a rookie perishes, we can just buy another one for 25 supplies. No big deal. But excluding the 12 PsyOps that I've modded into the game, we cannot train any more until the PsyLab is built. If we lose any soldiers, which we most likely will because they're not very good, we cannot replace them until we have the Scilab. So these soldiers are as useless as rookies, but as rare as the hero class factions. That's pretty much the worst possible combination you could have for a soldier. And if we lose a soldier or one of them takes an injury for a long period of time on the Gatecrasher mission, it's an automatic restart. We need as many soldiers healthy as we can possibly get. So you're probably beginning to understand the depths of difficulty that are going to be involved here. 
So what can we do to give ourselves a fighting chance? Well, to be honest, there's not that much, but there are a couple of things. The first is to make sure we start the campaign at Skirmisher HQ. This is one of the advanced options you can choose before starting a run. I don't normally worry about it because it normally doesn't make too much of a difference. But for our PsyOps, it makes a massive difference. See, scanning at Skirmisher HQ doubles the construction speed of facilities, and this actually includes excavations. We really want to rush excavating a power coil on the Avenger, because doing so gives us Illyrium. This is the fastest way we'll be able to research psionics and build the Psylab. But this actually introduces another level of RNG that is not present on other runs. The layout of the Avenger matters here. See, the Avenger consists of multiple rooms that you can excavate and then build facilities in. The location of the two power coil rooms that you'll always have is random. Now we need to have them easily accessible for us. If they're buried under too many other rooms that we have to excavate through, it's going to take too long to get to those power coils and dig them up. We won't be able to research psionics quickly enough and it'll be game over. On the first stream of this run, I restarted seven times. Either because we lost a unit on the Gatecrasher mission, or because the layout of the Avenger was no good. So yes, it was the eighth attempt before we even made it to the second mission. Things are that bad for this run. Now another tool that we can use to give ourselves a little bit of a leg up is the rifle from the Tactical Legacy Pack DLC. Now I haven't used these weapons in my previous runs, mainly because I forgot that they existed for the first few. I was tempted to use them on the Sharpshooters run, they would have come in handy, but I wanted to avoid it there to keep the run somewhat comparable with the other classes. I didn't want the Sharpshooters having an advantage that the other classes didn't get. But for this one, we really don't care about comparability. PsyOps are, without question, and excluding rookies, the single worst class you can do this kind of challenge with. We already know that, so here we just need every advantage that we can get. And this Legacy Pack rifle starts with a built-in scope. Now we do only get one of them, so we can't give them to everybody, so it's not much, but it is something. And the only other tool we can really use is to be smart with our bonds. My plan in the early game is to send soldiers who have a high bond compatibility out together. This will mean the maximum number of bonds for us as quickly as we can possibly get them. Now again, it's not much, but it's something. And as far as tools go, that's about all that we've got. Now, getting on to the run. Before the second mission, I only build a flashbang so that we've got a counter to sectoid psionic attacks. I skip building any facilities and the medikit that I normally go for, Going into this run, I knew that money, or supplies as the currency is called in this game, was going to be an issue, so I held off on buying anything unless we really needed it. But there is a bit of a spoiler alert here, supplies would actually end up being a much bigger issue than I had initially accounted for. So once we finally make it to the second mission, it's crucial that we win. As in, if we don't, it's another automatic restart. And the reason it's so important is because the second mission gives an engineer as a reward. Now, if we got an engineer as a scanning reward straight away, we could afford to lose this mission, but otherwise we have to win. Without an engineer, we cannot excavate in the Avenger, which means we can't get to our Illyrium and build our Psylab. And for this one, and quite a few missions in this run, at least in the early game, there's really not too much to say about the tactical layer. We set up on a roof and we pray for some good luck. And we thankfully get it. So we have an engineer. That's really good. So we get to excavating, and the plan is to camp at Skirmisher HQ on the strategic layer unless there's a really good scanning reward. 
Like here, we can get an extra scientist early, so that one is worth it. But if it's something like intel or even loot, I'm skipping it in favour of staying at the HQ and getting that excavation time bonus. And I know loot is good, but excavation and research are our main priorities in the early game. Everything else is secondary. And speaking of research, we want to rush the psionics research as quick as we can. The tree for this is to do alien biotech, then advent officer autopsy, then sectoid autopsy, and then psionics. However, it's very likely you'll unlock psionic research before you have the Illyrium to actually research it. This will happen if you haven't finished excavating the power coil by the time that you get to the psionics research. So you may be able to squeeze something like mag weapons or the alien rulers in there as well before you do psionics. Now the first chosen is the hunter. He has blast shield and shadow step, which are both really bad. His weakness is groundling, but as we've seen in previous videos, his grappling hook means he's usually on high ground, so this weakness isn't very helpful on him. But despite these bad abilities, I do find the Hunter is usually the easiest of the three chosen to deal with in the early game, so it's still a net positive for us. And it turns out luck is on our side with this one. When we encounter him, there's one of those random lookout towers. We're able to camp some of our troops there and take advantage of the aim bonus that we get from his groundling weakness. So I guess it wasn't that bad after all. Now when we finish the mission, Red Devil is left bleeding out with one turn left before she perishes. It was close, but we all made it out alive, and we beat the hunter. We're successful in another gorilla op, and I'm actually surprised at how well we're doing on the tactical layer. Advent are deploying stun lancers by this point, but our Psy rookies are still holding their own. I decide to build the proving grounds here. The frost bomb may help us out, and having the skulljack will be necessary for managing the avatar project. And we complete a clutch research breakthrough here, giving us an instant excavation. I use that on the second power coil once we're done digging up the first. It costs Solarium Crystals not only to research psionics, but also to both build and upgrade the Psylab. So having both power coils excavated is really useful. Then we have the first supply raid, and this one is fairly important to win. It will give us supplies, alloys, and Illyrium, which we're going to need to build more items and facilities and give our Psy operatives every advantage we can possibly get. And the RNG gods are kind to us on this one. They give us the Location Scout sit rep. This means we can see the whole map for the whole mission. And without this, I really don't think we would have won this mission. I spend a ridiculous amount of time exploiting line of sight to activate all the pods on our terms. It's quite an advantage when we can see where the bad guys are, but they have no idea where we are. And so with that victory, we have enough alloys for magnetic rifles, which will be a nice power bump. And now that we've got a decent amount of supplies, I build the resistance ring, and I've actually already constructed the infirmary by this point too. Now both of these things would turn out to be a mistake. See, I thought the infirmary would be useful as we are sustaining quite a few injuries. But the problem is you have to staff the infirmary with an engineer to benefit from the reduced healing time. And until our Psylab is constructed, we cannot afford to give up an engineer for this task. So the infirmary ended up being a waste of supplies. And once we finally have the Scilab built, it costs another 225 supplies to upgrade. Now the upgrade is essential as it lets you train two soldiers at once. So now we can't afford the upgrade because I blew too many supplies on the infirmary and the resistance ring. Also, I'll mention it now just because I know that some people will probably ask in the comments, the Scilab is a limited facility. You can only build one of them. So building multiple Scilabs in order to train more troops just is not possible, unfortunately. So now we can train one person at a time inside the Scilab. Now the great part is that because our soldiers are technically Psyops already, 
we get a choice as to which abilities to train on them. See, when you train a rookie into a PSYOP, the first ability they learn is random. But we can skip the random ability training and instead choose what ones we want. This is really helpful. And with 12 PSYOP soldiers, there's quite a few abilities to choose from. Now we initially want to prioritize Stasis and Soulfire. Stasis is an incredible ability, letting you shut down any enemy you like for their next turn. And Soulfire deals guaranteed damage and bypasses armor. Given frag grenades is still our only way to shred, this is going to be useful. Now Soulfire does have the drawback that it doesn't work on robotic enemies, but it's still very good to have. And these two abilities have shorter training times than a lot of the stronger abilities like Null Lance and Void Rift. So the priority initially is to get as many soldiers as we can with Stasis and Soulfire. We don't want to just train one person and have them be really powerful and everyone else still be useless. We want to share the abilities around. And because I'm so desperate for supplies, I end up spending some intel at the black market to purchase some. And again, I would end up regretting this decision later. I start making contact with the black site region. I really don't want to, but the avatar progress is filling and we need a way of reducing it. And the reason I don't want to make contact is because our Psy operatives are still very weak. And as the game starts deploying more difficult enemies, we're going to start losing missions fairly regularly. Any failed retaliation mission, supply raid, or council mission will cause you to lose contact with the region where the mission took place. But you can never lose contact with your starting region. So the longer we remain there, the less we have to worry about wasting intel on regions that we then just lose later on anyway. Now this of course compounds our problem of having limited supplies. Not contacting extra regions means no extra income from the council. And speaking of losing missions, let's have a look at this one. It's a retaliation mission and we have the mountain man and he's learned stasis. So finally, we have someone who is better than a rookie. Well, he gets one shot by a stun lancer, and just like that, he's gone. Now, we had already failed the mission because Advent took out too many civilians. I mean, it's three rookies and a rookie with stasis going up against mutons and vipers. We didn't have much of a chance here. But our top trained soldier is now lost. So that's effectively five days of training that we just wasted. We're now five days behind. And if this mission had been outside of our starting region, we would have lost the entire region as well. But very shortly after this, the avatar progress fills up and we're forced to hit the black site. I do have the Skulljack too, but there's no guarantee the next mission will spawn a captain. So we have to hit the black site while we can. Now we actually end up skulljacking a captain on the black site, so that's going to reduce the avatar project even further. And the hunter does show up on this one, of course, but he keeps his distance until we're almost at the evac zone. When he does show up, he does big damage on Red Devil, who goes down, and she's now bleeding out. Again. The hunter really does not like her. And she's the one who has the vial too, that we need to evac, so that's not great. But thankfully I left Cat right next to her, so she can pick Red Devil up and book it to the evac zone, and once again, we just barely escape with everybody's lives. So we finally got enough supplies to upgrade the Psy Chamber, so that's really good, we can now train two soldiers at a time, but the Hunter UFO is coming for us now that we've done the Black Site. It's not wasting any time in this campaign. The next Guerrilla Op is another loss, we are able to hold off the aliens, but we're just too slow and we run out of time. The majority of our troops still don't have any Psy abilities to speak of. And we end up losing another soldier too. We're starting to get really outpaced on the tactical layer. And things aren't too much better on the strategic layer either. I'll just outline the position as it currently stands. The Hunter UFO is coming for us. We have no means to slow down the avatar progress any further. 
We lack the intel to make contact with any more regions that may be housing alien facilities. And we lack the supplies to build radio relays so that we can reduce the intel cost. And this is where my previous spending is coming back to haunt me. Just like in real life. See, if I hadn't built the infirmary and the resistance ring, I'd have the supplies needed to upgrade the Scilab. So I wouldn't have had to spend intel on getting supplies from the black market. And that in turn would have meant we'd have more intel to be able to expand to a region housing an advent facility, which we could then hit in order to reduce the avatar progress. So it seems like we're in a downward spiral. But there is some hope. We can research an advent data pad to get some much needed intel, and there's a council mission that will reward us with even more intel. Our soldiers are learning more and more Psy abilities as time passes, but I'm still not sure they're up for a council mission. See, council missions are really bad because you cannot put down an emergency evac. So if we can't get to the set evac zone, we're losing more troops and we have no way of saving them. Even worse, this is a council mission where we do not start with concealment. We activate this pod, and even though we take down the trooper, it immediately reanimates as a zombie due to a dark event. Then a faceless appears due to a different dark event. Losing those guerrilla ops is really starting to take its toll. And we've used up half our turns before the mission ends just getting to this first pod because I was moving so slowly and cautiously. All the good that did me. It takes two turns to eliminate everything except the faceless. We still can't get it. And we end up just frost bombing the faceless and running away. As long as we move fast, it cannot hurt us. And we have to move fast anyway, otherwise the turn timer is going to expire and our troops are going to get left behind. Now unfortunately, we run right into a squad of vipers. Now this is probably the worst possible enemy we could come across at this point in the game. And the reason is because they can bind us with their tongue pull attack. Now this is much worse than just shooting at us, since this attack can mean that we're stuck in place, unable to move. If we were just being shot, we'd at least have a chance at evacing out, even if we took some damage. But these vipers can stop us dead in our tracks. And another faceless has spawned. So at this point, I decide it's pretty much every man, woman, and child for themselves, and we're just going to run to the evac. Whoever survives, survives, and whoever doesn't, doesn't. Well, Truncate and Drifter abound, and Leeson gets knocked from the top of a two-story building to the ground below. He has two HP left. On our turn, I hide the scientist out of line of sight, trying to keep them safe, and Chan cannot make it to the evac zone this turn anyway. So I decide I'll just move her in a bit closer, and then take a shot at the Viper Binding Drifter. Well, she misses the 86% shot, and Drifter is still stuck. Awesome. Meanwhile, Leeson actually can make it to the evac zone, so at least one person is getting out of here alive. And probably only one by the looks of things. This isn't going well. Once one of the Vipers is done with Truncate, she turns her attention to Chan and binds her. And while Chan is bound, she gets beaten to death by two Faceless. This is absolutely brutal. But the scientist actually makes it to the evac zone too, so that's something. Our soldiers sacrifice themselves for the good of the mission. And this is one of the rare times in XCOM where beating the mission was actually more important than keeping our soldiers alive. We really needed that intel and now we have it. But it turns out to all be in vain anyway. The avatar progress has filled again and there's not enough time to contact the region with the facility even though we now have the intel to do it. So alas, this one is over. Attempt number eight has ended the same way as one through seven. It just took a lot longer to get there. Now, some people in the chat wanted to see the film clip that triggers if you lose, so I had planned to wait around and just let the apocalypse come. But the aliens aren't having any of that. 
They hit us with the base defense mission. Talk about rubbing salt in the wound. And most of our best soldiers just met their end on that previous mission. So I send Red Devil out alone just to end our suffering quickly. Now ironically, she actually survives as most of the aliens ignore her and just beeline for the Avenger. But either way, this one is over and we didn't even get to see the cutscene. Sorry Twitch chat. Okay, so number 8 was no good. The main thing I think I learned on this run is that we have to be super conservative with spending supplies. So let's take that information that we've learned and apply it to attempt number 9. Oh, never mind. Let's take what we've learned and apply it to attempt number 10. And 10 actually starts out pretty good. No injuries on Gatecrasher and the power coils are situated in a good spot we can excavate them fairly easily. So we might actually be onto something here. And the same deal as last time, I buy a flashbang and that's it. We need to save our supplies, obviously. Now perhaps our good fortune is related to this brand new character we have. Um, yeah. And having a guy named Satan on our team isn't even the worst part. I look at the soldier bonds to see who is compatible. Sending highly compatible soldiers out together is the fastest way to get bonds growing quickly. And just look at this. Our soldiers who have high or very high compatibility with this guy number in the double digits. So it seems most of our soldiers worship Satan. Well, okay, this is adding a whole new layer of lore to XCOM, and it's kind of terrifying. So I figure Satan and Red Devil should make a pretty good duo for, well, obvious reasons, so we'll send them out together on this mission. And just like last time, we must win this one to get that engineer. If we don't, you'll soon be watching attempt number 11. Now sadly, this is the second mission, so of course Red Devil doesn't make it. And the main thing that ruined it for us was that reinforcements got dropped in. Red Devil was bleeding out, and without those reinforcements, we could have finished the mission in time to save her. Now reinforcements on the second mission is tough at the best of times, let alone with our Psy rookies. I mean, why are reinforcements even possible on the second mission? Why does this game want us to suffer like this? And why do we all keep volunteering to suffer like this? But hey, at least we've secured the engineer. It's not all bad. Now with Red Devil out, Satan still has plenty of other people wanting to be his friend in our cult of devil-worshipping alien killers. Lucy Lynch, you're the lucky one. But the truth is, I didn't get to use bonds that much in this attempt, at least not in the early game. We're regularly taking quite a few injuries, so most missions were simply a matter of sending whoever was healthy. We didn't have the luxury of always sending bonded soldiers out together. And I'm being super stingy with supplies this time around. The only facility I build is the Proving Ground so we can get the Skulljack. All other facilities are on hold until we have the Scilab. Our supplies are just way too limited. On the retaliation mission, we unfortunately have the assassin to deal with. I would have much preferred the hunter again. Her strengths are kinetic plating and shadow step. Her weakness is groundling. Now when we have a few soldiers with soul fire, that's an attack that's guaranteed to hit. So that kinetic plating will not bother us at all. But for right now, when all we have is rifles and soldiers with pretty low aim, it is pure nightmare fuel. Now we actually hold our own against the advent forces decently enough, but once the assassin shows up we are completely outclassed. She appears, sends task manager into bleed out with one shot and then sprints behind a wall into full cover. And there's still a trooper, sectoid and zombie active all at the same time. So we have to grab task manager and evac out. We're not going to win this one. And losing this mission is really bad since it reduces our monthly income. Plus, Task Manager is injured for 26 days. 
quite the setback that we've suffered here. But then we come across an opportunity, a really good one. The first supply raid mission has the Savage sit rep. This means there will be a bunch of faceless on the mission, and as long as we win, we'll have plenty of corpses for Mimic Beacons. Now purchasing Mimic Beacons may mean we have to forego other things that we may want, but the Beacons will be able to carry us through the game until we have enough high level Psy operatives. Now getting this sit rep is random, and I cannot understate how lucky we are for scoring it. We have to win this mission. Failure is simply not an option. This will make things so much easier going forward. And we need to win so badly, in fact, that I purchased three more flashbangs using up our precious resources. The flashbangs will slow down the faceless and give our soldiers the best chance possible at victory. And as long as we win, we'll get more resources so we can cover the cost of these flashbangs. So Lucifer is going to kick this one off with an 88% shot and... Oh. Oh no. That's not what we want to see right now. But it's okay, I'll get the flank with Drifter. We still have plenty of flashbangs. Ah! Wow. This is terrible. Really, really terrible. Whatever, we need to take out the Stun Lancer first. So we do take it out and we flash bang the one faceless close enough to attack, but the other three are now moving in on us. We are able to take out the first faceless and we then flash bang the other three on the next turn. But even the flashbang doesn't stop this one from attacking Metla and one-shotting him with a crit. Yeah, we can't make an 88% shot, but this thing can crit through disorientation. Just great. Just what we need. We shoot one of the faceless three times, we hit three times, and we roll minimum damage three times. That leaves this faceless alive and well with one HP. All we needed was to roll a four once, just one time, and it'd be gone. But no, of course not. We burn through our last flashbangs, and we are able to finish one more faceless, but Cloud and Drifter have taken big damage. In fact, Drifter is bleeding out. And here we get into what is essentially a stalemate. I'm trying to fall back with our troops so we can reload since we're out of ammo, but the Faceless appear to have the same movement speed as our soldiers, and we just can't put any distance between us and them. They just stay on top of us the whole time. These things are pretty fast considering they're literally giant blobs of goo. So there's no possible way we can safely reload and attack these things, and Cloud only has one point of HP left. She's not going to survive another hit. So instead we just grab Drifter and evac. There was no way we were going to win that mission. That 88% miss and activating the second pod on the same turn sealed our fate. Not to mention the unlucky crit with Metla getting one shot. So not only have we failed the mission and missed out on the resources we need, resources like alloys to build mag weapons and supplies to build facilities, we've also wasted a bunch of supplies that we did have on flashbangs. And we lost a soldier. This is terrible, and I was so frustrated here. We needed to win so badly, and I guess that's what we get for trusting a guy named Lucifer. There's a reason they say you shouldn't make deals with the devil. We have a council mission, and Leeson is gunned down by this mech. Sorry Leeson, you're not evacuing out of this one. Thankfully everyone else, including the VIP, does make it out alive, mostly because Advent was too busy focusing on the lost, while I did my best to keep our troops out of line of sight while we just rushed to the evac. The assassin shows up on a guerrilla op and again goes for task manager. She at least doesn't one-shot him this time, so that's something but we are forced to evac again, and the spider and fly dark event triggers. Now normally this would be really bad, but we don't have a resistance ring yet anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. 
We get a breakthrough research that lets us add an extra weapon mod to our rifles, so that should come in pretty useful. We need all the tools we can get. I give the second retaliation mission a half-hearted go, but we evac very quickly. Mutons are simply too much for us right now, and even if we did survive, there's no way we'd be able to keep enough of the civilians alive to win the mission. Heck, we don't even have the Scilab or magnetic weapons built yet, so we're actually behind attempt number 8. We're doing worse than last time. And I think the main reasons are one, because we failed more missions, so that's deprived us of resources. And two, we didn't get that instant excavation this time around, so that slowed down construction of the Scilab. And here, because of the wasted supplies and failed missions, I'm forced to once again spend intel on supplies at the black market. This is something I really didn't want to do, but I don't see much other choice. This run is looking really bad, but I'm going to hang in there and see just how far we can get. Even if we don't succeed, I should still be able to learn more to make the next run more successful. So we're finally able to get mag rifles in the Scilab, but once again, we cannot afford the upgrade. So we're only training a single soldier at a time for now. And look at this. Our monthly income is three supplies. Three. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to afford that Scilab upgrade for a while. But with a new supply drop, the black market stock has been refreshed. So I burn through even more intel to get enough Illyrium crystals and supplies to get that upgraded Scilab. Now again, this is really bad, but the upgraded Scilab is vital to our success. It's more important. We begin making contact with the Black Site region, but before we can, another Gorilla Op is up. And this dark event is signal jamming, which doubles all scan times on the strategic layer. This could literally end the run. If we can't make contact with other regions quickly enough, we'll lose to the Avatar project. We're not able to win the mission, but we do stop the dark event, and that's the main thing. We take out the general and then evac before the rest of the enemies can obliterate us. And having a couple of soldiers who have now learned stasis certainly makes this task a bit easier. So we're still hanging on, but only barely. I'm then forced to sell corpses and other resources in order to get enough supplies to build the Skulljack. I really should have done this earlier, but we're just so broke that I wanted to hold off. We get another breakthrough research, this time to reduce the cost of constructing a resistance comms facility. Normally, I never take these breakthroughs that just make things cheaper. The research time is usually more valuable than the supplies, but given how broke we are, and the fact that we really don't have anything useful to research anyway, I go for this one. And as bad as this run is going, that is one thing that I really like about these challenge runs, they often force you to play the game differently from how you normally would, and strategies that you would never have considered in the past all of a sudden seem like a great idea. After we've cleared enough rooms on the Avenger, we can afford plated armor. You do get supplies for clearing regular rooms. And we completed the research for plated armor ages ago, but we just didn't have enough supplies to actually buy it. And speaking of supplies, you thought a supply drop of three was bad? How about zero? This bald man is criticizing what a terrible job we're doing while literally giving us nothing to help. Thanks guy, thanks a lot, that's really helpful. We now make it to the same council mission where everyone but Leeson got left behind on attempt number eight, but this time around the assassin is here, so it's even worse. She can summon priests now as well. Better than summoning mechs, I suppose, so we'll take it as a win. Now that same pot of vipers is here, but this time we wreck them. We have a few soldiers with soul fire by this point, and two soul fires is guaranteed to end a viper. Not to mention we have one use of stasis too. The assassin appears and goes for Lucifer this time. Task manager isn't on this mission, otherwise I'm sure she would have targeted him again. Now the good news about her being here is that the turn timer stops while she's active. 
Of course, the bad news is that she may very well destroy all of us while she's active. Her summoned priest mind-controlled Truncate, but we've got the Frost Bomb by now, and we can use that to not only disable the priest, but to end the mind control as well. The assassin disappears, and I'm not able to locate her with movement preview cheese, so I instead just focus on the priest and finish it. I figure it's better to attack the priest rather than waste our turns, with no guarantee that we'll even find where the assassin is. Now once she reveals herself again, then we start hammering her with everything we have. And a nice fact here, in addition to ignoring her armor points, Soulfire actually goes straight through her shielding too, so that's really nice to know. And finally, after being defeated by her twice before, this time we take her down. And this shows how having even one ability like Soulfire can make such a big difference on the tactical layer. This time around, everyone is able to evac to safety. We do have a couple of injuries, but this is a much better outcome than last time. Now the avatar progress fills here, but we're already in the process of making contact with the black site region, so we should be okay. However, while we're scanning to make contact, a gorilla rock becomes available. We decide to try this mission since it may spawn a captain. If we can Skulljack it and get the Codex, that will reduce the Avatar progress and we won't have to worry about the Black Sight until a little later. Well, on the mission, there's three pods and two turrets all sitting right on top of the objective. So I'm not loving our chances here, I will be honest. And I decide pretty quickly to forget about stopping the Dark Event and instead we'll just focus on getting the Captain. So I set up an overwatch ambush and wait for the bad guys to come to us. It takes them a little while, but eventually they do. I then fall back off this ridge and out of line of sight. This should force the captain to move up to us and we can then deploy the skulljack. So on the next turn, we climb back up just to have a peek at what the enemies are doing. Yeah, the captain is here and so are all the other enemies. These advent guys can move pretty fast when they need to, it seems. I really didn't expect them to be this close. I mean, the purifier made it to us, so I should have expected them to be this close, but mistakes happen. And then I do two things really wrong here. I should have thrown the evac down before I sent anyone up the ridge. That way Mountain Man could have attacked with his second action. But because I didn't, his second action is now going to be wasted moving into the evac zone. The other thing I did wrong was placing Mountain Man on the ladder that leads up to the ridge. This made access more difficult for the rest of our troops. Now we are able to skulljack the captain, but losing an attack with Mountain Man plus an unfortunate miss has meant that we cannot eliminate the codex. So it looks like we're going to the black site after all. A codex spawns on this one and we eliminate it, so we've fulfilled that objective now, that's good. Oh, and the dark event that we just failed to stop, it was the Lost World event, so the Lost can now show up on any mission. And they do, on this one. So now we've got Lost as well as the Assassin to deal with. Now the plan is to stand on top of the first building and block the ladders to stop the Lost from reaching us. But between having to revive people from the assassin's attacks, plus needing to attack the assassin and getting line of sight, we have to reposition quite a bit so the plan doesn't really work. And to make matters worse, when the lost attack the assassin and miss because their accuracy is so bad, she gains shield points. Kinetic plating really sucks. Thankfully the lost are good for something though. Both the assassin and the priest that she summoned in target them over us. We can then finish the assassin. The priest takes a little bit longer to get rid of, in no small part because of sustain, but he doesn't damage any of our troops. That's the main thing. Drifter did get reduced to 1 HP in that exchange, so it was a close fight, but we prevailed and we can now push on. And the rest of the mission goes off without a hitch. 
So we've reduced the avatar progress, which is good. And something interesting to note here, or at least I thought it was interesting. Now see, we actually hadn't been completing any research because there was literally no research for us to do. We had one research option available, but we didn't have the required resources to actually do it. And the main reason there's not much research available to us is because we've been evacing out of so many missions and not collecting corpses. Corpses make up a big chunk of research and we're locked out of quite a bit of it. But none of that is the interesting part. The interesting thing is that when we return to research, now that we can do the Shadow Chamber, there's a random breakthrough here waiting for us. And this happened quite a few times in the campaign. We would be completing no research for a while, and then when I went to finally start some, we'd have a breakthrough there without the game ever telling us about it. Now I have installed a mod for this run that reduces pop-up notifications on the strategic layer, so maybe in the vanilla game we would have been told about the breakthroughs, I'm not sure. But either way, if you ever have no research going, it may be worth checking back on the lab every now and then just to see if any breakthroughs have become available. So we've lowered the avatar progress by two, but we need to keep pushing to an advent facility as that bar is just going to fill up again quite quickly. And here we encounter a monumental problem. A potentially run-ending problem, in fact. The alien cipher dark event has triggered, which doubles all intel costs. So expanding to this next region is going to cost us 160 intel instead of 80. Now I could build a radio relay here to reduce the intel cost, but that's not actually going to help with our problem. See, even after this region, we need to contact one more to reach the facility. So we still won't have enough intel to get to where we want to be, even with that radio relay. And on top of that, we probably don't have time to build two radio relays, and we definitely don't have the supplies. So getting to that region is simply beyond us right now. So there's every chance that this will end the run, but I decide to push on. Maybe the alien cipher event will end soon, and then we'll still have time to make it to that facility. I know it's a long shot, but it's really all that we've got at this stage. But then things go from bad to even worse. We have a retaliation mission in the Black Sight region. Now Berserkers are going to be deployed here, so our chances of winning are basically non-existent. And once we lose the mission, we'll lose that entire region. And then, instead of being two regions away from the facility, we'll be three regions away. And once again, spending that intel on supplies is coming back to haunt me. If I hadn't done that, we'd have enough intel to contact the next region before failing the retaliation mission. And then losing the Black Sight region wouldn't matter so much as we'd have already secured the next region along the chain. But here, we're going to lose the whole thing. So naturally, we lose the mission like you'd expect. We actually do beat the aliens, we just can't do it quickly enough and we lose too many civilians. And this was a really big map with the civilians quite spread out. So it would have been tough to win with a regular squad, let alone our still relatively useless Psy operatives. We have bought tier 2 Psy Amps by this stage, so our soul fire attacks are doing a bit more damage, which is nice. And beating the aliens is good, it means we get at least some corpses and can continue doing research. But it honestly seems for naught. We've lost the Black Sight region, and all I can do is start scanning to make contact with it again. That's more intel and time that's now being used up. Then we have this supply raid, and I'd really like to win this one. Having a surplus of resources would be really nice, given that we've been so broke for so long. Now Lost World triggers again, and it turns out to be the saving grace that we need. See, we can hide up on top of the ridge, out of line of sight of the enemies. This causes the Lost and Advent to focus on each other, rather than us. 
The Lost are basically acting like free mimic beacons for us here. I mean, admittedly, free mimic beacons that want to peel our faces off and feast on our flesh, but free mimic beacons all the same. We just have to take out the ones that get too close to us and leave the rest standing. They'll be the decoy that we need. And this takes a lot of the pressure off us. And even when the bad guys do start to overwhelm us, we can use grenades to quickly call in more Lost to back us up. And we do actually win this mission. It takes ages, and we do take an injury, but we win all the same. But during this mission, something even better has happened here. Twitch viewer DrawKillFoxy tells me that a new advent facility has popped up in the region right next to our starting one. Now, I didn't notice this before the mission. I'm not always the most observant person in the world, I will admit. But Foxy is right, and this has saved our run. We're definitely going to have the intel and the time to get to this facility. So yes, Foxy, you did get your shout out. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks once again for the excellent intel. And even better, Alien Cypher is finished as well. This is exactly what we needed. Perhaps this run isn't doomed after all. It really does come down to the wire though. We've got about three days until we fail the game from the Avatar project, and we'll be done making contact with the region in about two days. While we're scanning, a Gorilla Op comes up, but we just have to skip it, because flying to and from the mission may take up too much time and literally cause us to fail the whole game. So whatever those dark events were, I hope they weren't too bad. So we head out to the new facility, and Lucifer by this point is quite powerful. He's learned both Void Rift and Domination, which are two of the strongest abilities the Psyop has. So we activate Void Rift, and it probably looks kind of insane what happens here. The mech immediately guns down the Stun Lancer. You don't see that every day. See, Void Rift also has a chance to apply Insanity, on top of doing guaranteed damage. So I think what happened is that the mech went into Overwatch, the Stun Lancer meanwhile was hit with an insanity and we scored a mind control. This meant the Stun Lancer was on our team when it scattered and the mech shot it up. Now this is good for us as it means our troops don't have to worry about the Overwatch. We take the pot out and the Warlock appears, this is the first mission in his territory after all. His strengths are Shogun, Revenge, and Soul Stealer. His weakness is Shell Shocked, which is not a bad one for him to have. We move around the rear entrance as the front has multiple turrets. We don't really have an effective way of dealing with turrets just yet, apart from grenades. And I'd rather save the grenades for the Warlock himself. There's a pod at the back of the building which contains a shield bearer, and I decide we should recruit him to our side and we use Domination. Now Domination gives you permanent mind control of one enemy unit for the rest of the mission. Well, it's mostly permanent. If the PSYOP controlling them perishes or evacs or has something else happen to them, you'll lose the mind control, but short of that, you've got an extra soldier for the remainder of the encounter. Now I'm not sure if anyone will have an issue with this, but let's address it just in case. The shield bearer isn't technically a psyop. Well, not technically, it's not a psyop at all. So should we be allowed to use it? And the bigger question is should we be allowed to use mind controlled units in general? Now I believe the answer is yes. The psyop is controlling the shield bearer, or whatever unit we choose to mind control, I'll stick with Shield Bearer because that's what we're using in this instance. It'll just make the conversation a bit easier. So because the PSYOP is controlling the Shield Bearer, the Shield Bearer just becomes an extension of the PSYOP. The same way that the Rifle or the PSYAMP is an extension of the PSYOP. These things are tools that the PSYOP can use in combat. 
Now, you can argue that describing a living organism as an extension of the PSYOP raises all kinds of ethical concerns, and I would agree with you, but we're talking about aliens in a video game, so let's leave the ethical considerations for another day. From a purely functional standpoint, my comparison is apt. This shield bearer is now a tool for the PSYOP to use. It is under the PSYOP's complete control. So for me, not allowing mind-controlled units would be the same as not allowing the PSYAMP or the rifle because those things aren't a PSYOPerative. They're just tools that the PSYOPerative uses. And some people may make the argument that the shield bearer isn't an extension of the PSYOP because the commander is the one controlling the shield bearer. We're the ones giving the orders, not the PSYOP themselves. But I disagree with this. And the reason I disagree is like I said before, if the PSYOP leaves the battlefield, we lose control of the shield bearer. So it seems very clear to me that the shield bearer is obeying the PSYOP, not the commander. It's simply because the PSYOP is obeying the commander that the shield bearer is then forced to do the same. So all that being said, I did go on a little bit of a rant, I apologize for that, but I think mind-controlled units are fair game, and they don't break any rules of the challenge. I hope you agree. But back to the mission, mind-controlling shield bearers can be a really awesome move. We can use their shield ability on our squad to give us a massive defense boost. And the AI usually isn't smart enough to prioritize taking out the shield bearer, so our shields should be good for a while. Now the warlock has positioned himself behind indestructible full cover, and I'm not hugely keen on going in there to face him, mainly because there's still a mech and an archon coming after us. So I decide we'll just plant the X4 and leave. Now the warlock does mind control task manager, which could be a problem, but we're able to break the mind control with a frost bomb, we then plant the X4 and we bounce. We've reduced the avatar progress slightly thanks to the game throwing us a bone at the 11th hour, but I'm still worried. It's going to fill up again fast, so we want to keep making a beeline for the original facility we were after. That facility has a lot more blocks of progress on the avatar bar than the facility that we just took out. Now the trade-off to that is it does have an alien ruler as well. That's very bad, but we have to risk it. We're pretty desperate here. During this time, we get a council supply drop and a few positive things to note here. One is that we have a covert op to further reduce the avatar progress. That's going to buy us some time. That's exactly what we need. The second is, look at our supplies. We've come a long way from the zero we were getting for a while there. So maybe things are beginning to turn around for us. We make contact with the next region, so now we're only one region short of the facility. We're getting closer. But this new area we've discovered is the Hunter's Territory. So he's going to be on this next mission. And we need to win this one, otherwise we lose the region. We only just got here and we cannot afford to lose it right away. Plus, if we win, we'll get some much needed intel. Because success is so vital on this one, I send the best four psyops we have. We have multiple dominations and fuses at this point, which should be really good. Fuse allows you to detonate enemies' grenades on your turn. It doesn't always do a massive amount of damage, but it has two things going for it that make it a pretty excellent ability. One is that detonating the grenade means the enemy cannot use the grenade on you because you've already blown it up. And secondly, it has no cooldown time. So turn after turn, you can just keep detonating the enemy's own explosives on them. You're really only limited by the number of grenades the bad guys are carrying. We get a bad concealment blow on the first pod, but this team is good enough to deal with it. A domination quickly brings the trooper onto our side, we frostbomb the mech, 
and the purifier goes for the trooper rather than any of our psyops. So this has gone quite well. Of course, now our concealment's gone, so the hunter spawns in. His strengths are general, watchful, and low profile. His weakness is bewildered. Now, low profile is normally annoying, but with abilities like Soulfire and Null Lance that are guaranteed to hit, it shouldn't actually be that bad on this run in particular. Our newly acquired trooper, who we've named Billy, is now on fire thanks to that purifier. Now, normally hunkering down is the best way to put out fire on a soldier, but Advent troops can't actually hunker down. It's not an ability that they have. And there's no water anywhere either. So Billy is forced to just slowly be turned to a crisp, and all we can do is watch it happen. It's actually kind of dark, really. Now, maybe we could use a medikit, but we really want to save those for our psyops, so I don't think that's going to happen. Sorry, Billy. And the hunter here is way more aggressive than usual. He charges straight for us. He summons in two troopers and stuns three of our soldiers with a grenade. He also goes into Overwatch because of the watchful ability. This guy is not pulling any punches in this mission. Now Drifter's the only one who's not dazed. He's thankfully able to avoid the Overwatch and revive two of the downed soldiers. We take over one of the hunter's troopers with domination. We've named this guy Bob. The other trooper we hit with insanity, but we only get a disorientation. I was hoping for a mind control or panic, but no luck. The good news is that he at least can't throw his grenade on us now. Now, since the trooper is disoriented, it of course hits us with a crit, because we all know disorientation leads to crits. The hunter, meanwhile, targets Billy, which is perfect. On the next turn, we take the hunter down, and on the turn after that, we take out the remaining trooper. We push on to the VIP and encounter another pod where we dominate a stun lancer. His name is Thornton. And it's really satisfying turning the tables on Advent like this. Like, they throw enemies at us, but we just take them and bolster our ranks even further. They make us more powerful. However, we are now out of dominations. You can only use this ability once per turn. Well, you can only use it successfully once per turn. We smash the pod and grab the VIP. On our way to the evac zone, reinforcements drop down on us. The Billy Bob Thornton trio provide cover for us while we evac out. And before anyone asks, you cannot evac mind-controlled soldiers with the rest of the squad. So unfortunately, we have no choice but to leave these boys behind. I know it's heartbreaking, but all we can do is push on and to make sure Billy Bob Thornton's sacrifice was not in vain. And we're finally looking pretty good on the supplies front, so I build the resistance ring. It's taken a while, but it's nice to have. See, the assassin is gradually growing in power, so having the ring is going to make it easier for us to hunt her down. And the resistance ring investment immediately pays off as we get a covert op to reduce avatar progress even further. This is really good. There's a gorilla op with the barrier dark event. This will double the psionic defenses of enemies, making abilities like domination far less likely to work. So we need to stop this one. And the last couple of missions have gone quite well. So I've got a good feeling about this one too. We take out the first pod except for this heavy mech. I could use stasis to shut it down, but I decide to risk it and just take the shot. As long as we don't roll minimum damage, we'll take it out. And even if we do roll minimum damage, our troops are spread out. It won't use its missiles against us, so we should be fine. Wow, a one-shot from a mech. I really didn't expect that. And Lucifer was our strongest soldier too. Now he's gone. I really should have gone for the stasis. Truth be told, I had just gotten a bit cocky after the last few victories, and I thought the chance of being able to finish the mech so we could keep moving as quickly as possible on the next turn was worth the risk. Clearly, I was wrong. 
So let's go back to playing conservatively, shall we? Now thankfully the general we have to take out comes to us. That saves us the trouble of having to go find him. We dominate the purifier and we finally take out the mech. The trooper targets the purifier, which is honestly fine. It means our soldiers haven't taken any damage. The general tries to run for it here, but as long as we can get line of sight, soul fire is a guaranteed hit. So we take him out pretty easily. However, in the process, we have activated another pod with an Andromedon. And we're down to three soldiers after losing Lucifer, and most of our abilities are on cooldown. So we evac out. Eliminating the general means we've stopped the dark event, we just miss out on the reward, and I'm honestly fine with this. I'm not fine with losing Lucifer though, that one really stings. We had invested a lot of time into training him, and now he's gone. That time has been wasted. Losing him certainly isn't game ending, since we have multiple high level soldiers now, but all the same, I'm gonna have to be more careful moving forward. A psyops are a precious resource, and we need to take care of them. When we're one day away from making contact with the facility region, I stop scanning. By leaving it one day short, we can quickly access the region if we need to in the event of an avatar progress spike, but if we haven't actually made contact, we don't have to worry about failing any missions there and losing the region. So this area is now kind of a backup plan that we can utilize if things get desperate enough. We also start hunting the assassin here. We're not ready to face her just yet, but doing the covert ops now will mean the mission is accessible when we are ready. And before long, we get another covert op to unlock one of the best resistance orders in the game, Sabotage. This takes one block off the avatar bar at every council drop. This gives us more time before we have to worry about expanding out and tackling story missions. That's time for us to train more soldiers. This is really awesome. We have the Chrysalid Retaliation mission next, and we actually win. And it's one of those missions where the resistance fighters seem to do more against Advent than we do. See, we get stuck engaging this Andromedon for what feels like an eternity. It's just an endless barrage of stasis every turn until we can finally destroy it. There were some codexes to deal with at the same time, and having to take out all the clones slowed us down too. We don't yet have any blue screen rounds, so codexes are still quite a nuisance. But while we're dealing with the Andromedon, the Resistance does a great job of protecting the civilians. And then before we can finish it off, the Assassin shows up. So that's a massive hindrance as well. But thanks to Soulfire and Null Lance, even full cover doesn't help her, and she goes down. The next Gorilla Op we're forced to evac out of. We mostly just got bad luck with three pods, two containing Andromedons, all located very close to one another. They activated more quickly than we could deal with them, and at this point it seems the missions we send the high level soldiers out on go fine, but when those guys aren't available, either because of fatigue or injury, we still struggle on the tactical layer. We unlock beam rifles here. Normally I get plasma weapons before powered armor, but the powered armor was inspired, meaning it would take less time to research if we did it then and there. And we're relying on our Psy abilities more than our guns by this stage, so I figured the rifles could wait a bit longer. We don't have the supplies necessary to actually build them yet though, so I guess they'll have to wait even longer again. We hit up the black market to gather more supplies, and were able to build plasma rifles and the shadow chamber. It only took us until August. Nice. And truth be told, things continue going pretty well for the next little while, and I actually get to build the GTS. Now you may be a bit confused by this. I said we couldn't get squad size upgrades, right? Well, not exactly. See, while it's true the GTS won't recognize our PsyOps promotions, it will recognize the promotions of other soldiers. So we complete a covert op to get a Templar. She's quite a high level by this point in the game, 
high enough to give a squad size 1 and 2 in fact. Then we just dismiss her from the barracks and we still get to keep the upgrades even after she's gone. Now, the rules for this run are that we're only using Psy operatives in combat. We never once used the Templar in combat, so it's not against the rules. So now we can send six soldiers out on missions. This is going to be a game changer. Or not? Of course, literally the first mission after purchasing squad size upgrades, we get the surgical sit rep, so we're limited to three troops. Like we spend supplies to send more soldiers out onto the field, and the game immediately forces us to send less. That is so XCOM. So we send the best three soldiers we have available, and we pray to the gods of RNG. The first pod goes down quite easily, but the second pod, well, with the second pod, our aforementioned prayers go unanswered. I keep trying for mind control and insanity, but they just keep failing. I was really annoyed by this bad RNG, so much so that I do something really silly here. See, we were finally able to mind control one Archon, so we activate the next pod, which has a gatekeeper, and I go for blazing pinions. Not only is this pointless because the pod will simply move out of the way, but moving that far forward activates another pod. I was quite frustrated here, and this resulted in me making a really bad play. So our mind controlled Archon doesn't last very long, and then the bad guys come for our Psy soldiers. Task Manager gets shadow bound, so now we're down to two troops. Not a great position to be in, but Drifter has solace, so if I move him over to Task Manager, we can revive him and... Or maybe we can't do that. So yeah, apparently Solace doesn't revive Shadowbound Soldiers. I've heard that Revival Protocol does, apparently. So I did actually reload the game here. The description of Solace very clearly indicates that it will cure Soldiers of any mental status effects. And that's not actually true. It will not help with Shadowbound. So given the ability doesn't work as it says it does, I consider this a legitimate reload under our Honest Man rules. Hopefully you agree. But either way, that was a really bad mission. But surely the next one has to go better. We can finally take a full squad of six. Now it's another one where we have to neutralize the target, and it's an annoying map since we're moving through the street and pods, both Advent and Lost are activating either side of us. There's not a lot of good cover, which limits our options. And this mech is super annoying. It's standing in a crater in the middle of the road, and we have to be ridiculously close to get line of sight. And given how dangerous these things can be, thinking about Lucifer, this is a problem. And we end up getting blasted with some missiles, this is honestly better than it shooting at us since no one can get one shot by the missiles, but of course one of them lands a crit. I didn't even know that missiles could land crits with advent units, but there you go, apparently they can. On the flip side, blasting three lost and the general with a null lance is pretty satisfying, I have to admit. Then I have another idea which should be pretty satisfying too. See, we dominated this Stun Lancer earlier, so I move him in to finish off the General. This should be pretty cool to see. Ah! Well, alright, that wasn't as cool as I was hoping it would be. But we're thankfully able to stasis the big tin can so it can't hurt us. We finish off the general, and then a frost bomb is good for disabling one of the mechs while bringing in more lost. Now this is of course a double-edged sword. The good news is that advent focus on the lost over us, which is what we want. But the trade-off is that we also take some damage from the lost. But I'd much rather take damage from the zombie boys than from heavy mechs. So I think it was a fair price to pay. So we do make it out alive, but nearly the whole team has suffered injuries at the end of this mission. 
But even considering the injuries, the fact we were able to deal with a bad sectopod activation and still win the mission should hopefully show you that our Psy operatives have gotten a lot stronger since the start of this run. Now the injuries do mean we have to skip this next retaliation mission. We're still not quite where we need to be power level wise. We do have some extremely powerful soldiers, we just don't have enough of them. We need more troops with Null Lance, Domination and Void Rift to really turn the tables on Advent. And before too long, the tension begins rising once again. We have a council drop, and in addition to being back to zero supplies a month due to failing more missions, the Assassin has now reached max level. She can launch a base assault against us at any moment. But I'm also annoyed because we have an ambush mission. Now I think this was the third ambush mission for this campaign by this stage, and later on there would actually be a fourth one. Now, at least for me, ambush missions are really boring. They're probably my least favourite part of the game, apart from dodge. I mean, ambush missions are fun the first few times, but after that they just get tedious. They're always the same thing on the same map type. Having some different objectives and different map types could have made them much more interesting, but alas, that's not the case. So just as I'm discussing with Twitch chat how these missions are super easy and just a chore where I've never lost a single soldier, the game throws two Andromedons at us. I guess it didn't appreciate me talking all that trash. Now we do have three soldiers on this mission, so that's good at least. I fall back with Kaiser and Depression. Meanwhile, DJ is trapped in a hallway to nowhere with the second Andromedon guarding his only escape route. Now DJ can use stasis to give himself enough time to get away, while Kaiser and Depression take out the other Andromedon. We regroup upstairs, this breaks the remaining Andromedon's line of sight. I keep the soldiers spread out so we don't get an acid bomb if it does decide to chase us up here, but thankfully it doesn't, it instead just targets the lost. Now given the lost are generally doing one damage to this thing when they do attack it, we need to go down and deal with it ourselves, otherwise we're going to be here forever. So we drop down and we send it into second form, then we begin the world's most ridiculous game of tag as we run away from the shell and it desperately chases us. And just an interesting little note here, even if you lose line of sight on a shell, you may be able to still tell where it is by observing the acid trail that it leaves behind. Now eventually we do take it down and we evac to safety. So it was a little touch and go there, but we didn't lose anyone this time either. So these missions are still a chore and still not very interesting. You lose this one game. And we continue getting lucky with covert ops that reduce the avatar progress. I'm pretty sure we would have lost the campaign quite a while ago without these. And then it's time for the assassin. We've got a pretty good A team, so we should be able to handle it. Our problem on the tactical layer at this stage is purely a numbers game. We have powerful troops, but only enough for one squad. So when we're sending out the lower level soldiers, we're still having issues. But this team here, eliminating the assassin should be a simple task. Especially now that we finally have some blue screen rounds, that's gonna help us deal with the mechanical enemies. I also take a couple of battle scanners because she's the assassin. Battle scanners are always good to have. And we're in. We've made it to her base before she got to ours. And a few people asked me about the chosen base defense after my first sharpshooters run. Why am I so eager to avoid having to play this mission? And the truth is, I've only done it once or twice in the five years that War of the Chosen has been out. It's a pretty easy mission to avoid when you're not punishing yourself with some ridiculous challenge run. So I'm afraid that I'm probably not very good at that type of mission, and that could hurt our campaign. And the other issue is simply one of time. It's an extra mission that can be fairly lengthy, and it's just going to make the campaign last longer than it needs to. That means I've got less time to get content out for you good people. And it's not just the length of the mission itself, 
It will leave a lot of soldiers tired, which will slow down our progress on the strategic layer too. So it's just better to avoid it if we can. And while I've been ranting about base defense missions, you can probably see the first part of the Assassin Stronghold is not that much of a challenge. Like I said earlier, the A-Team is quite powerful by this stage. We just take things slow and steady, overwatch creeping, and giving our abilities plenty of time to recharge. As long as we do that, there's not too much that Advent can do to stop us. Now I do avoid using any dominations here, since mind controlled units will not follow us into the final chamber. We want to save those mind controls for the battle with the assassin. That's when we're going to need the extra troops. And speaking of, a mech and stun lancer are the greeting party in the final chamber. We immediately convert the stun lancer to our side. We also make short work of the mech, despite some comical XCOM misses. A battle scanner locates the assassin once she has arrived, and we then pummel her with void rifts and null lances. She is behind indestructible full cover, but that will not save her from our psionic attacks. She does have a lot of health though, and we don't have anything like rapid fire which can deal massive damage, so she does survive. I send the stun lancer out right in front of her face, hoping he'll act as bait, but the assassin is too smart for that. She goes for Drifter, the guy controlling the Stun Lancer. And that was actually really well played on her part. I'm impressed with the AI there. We take her out on the next turn and convert one of the priests she summoned to our side as well. The other one we can easily shut down with Stasis. The reinforcements are a Chrysalid and Spectre. But between Stasis and our Mimic Beacon, we can safely focus on the Sarcophagus and destroy it. Now she does only have 50% HP, but quite a few of our Null Lancers and Soul Fires are still on cooldown. Thankfully this time she's behind destructible cover, so we can blow that up and then rely on guns where we need to. Guns with repeaters no less. Goodbye Assassin. We get hit with the Gorilla Op and left behind is one of the Dark Events. Now this is a terrible one to get since it results in the possibility of your soldiers being captured on all covert ops. But look at our roster. We're fresh off the Assassin Stronghold and we've been pushing our top level troops way too hard. Only the low level ones are available and they won't be able to win anyway, so sending them out is pointless. Oh, and ignore the random Reaper in the barracks here. I just kept forgetting to dismiss them. We didn't use them in the challenge at all. Then the avatar progress fills yet again, but we had already started a sabotage covert op, so we reduce it pretty much straight away. Then quite a bit of time passes without too much interesting happening. We're just training more soldiers to learn more abilities, but eventually we do get this breakthrough for plus one damage on beam weapons. That's going to be very nice. And then look at this one. We have a supply raid and we panic this purifier with an insanity attack. It actually attacks us in its panic. And I never knew this could happen, which is why I included it in the video. Turns out sometimes causing your enemy to panic can give them a free attack against you. So XCOM is really XCOMing this run. So for an enemy this annoying, I figure they deserve a special farewell. So let's send in the stun lancer. Go get this scumbag. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Thanks to Twitch viewers Cerebral Cloud and Sinpai Kuranan for clipping this. It was quite the sight to behold. And it made finding the footage to edit this video much easier. So much appreciated both of you. After the mission, we get a breakthrough for plus one damage on our rifles as well. So they're now doing a minimum of nine damage, which is kind of insane. Now we are really only relying on rifles for robotic enemies, but even so, nine damage is nine damage. That's really good. We soon have another set of Gorilla Ops, but I decide instead to hit the Warlock Stronghold. Now strategically, this is a terrible decision. Taking out the Warlock will leave our best troops tired and will be forced to skip the Gorilla Op. The Gorilla Op is a timed mission. 
The Warlock's base is not. We can hit the Warlock any time we want. And truth be told, the run had been going for over 20 hours at this point when you include all the restarts, and we're still nowhere close to finishing. I was just growing impatient and really wanted to make some solid progress. On top of that, the Hunter and Warlock are gradually gaining strength at roughly the same pace. I can't leave both of them to max level before we attack them, otherwise one of them will probably get to launch a base defense mission. So let's just go get the Scullet Man, and then we don't have to worry about him anymore. But truthfully, I'm not actually worried about him at all. We have multiple soldiers with Solace, which completely negates any of the Warlock's mental attacks, so he shouldn't be able to do all that much to us. We blunder into this pod of a Berserker and multiple Chrysalids, I consider using Domination on the Berserker, not because we need to, but just because having a Hulk-like monstrosity on our team would be pretty cool. But we still don't have that many soldiers with Domination, so I decide that we'll save them for the final chamber. We'll just obliterate the Berserker instead. I do end up mind controlling a Priest later on though, this was just because we got a bad pot activation, and I didn't really have any other way of shutting it down. Some of our soldiers were flanked, so the priest may have tried shooting at us. I figure burning through a domination is better than taking damage. When we arrive at the elevator, we say goodbye to our new friend, and then we head down to face the warlock. And luckily, in the final chamber, there's another priest to replace the old one, and a stun lancer too. Welcome to the team, both of you. The Warlock then arrives, and he's picked up the Planewalker ability, so we go for the Frost Bomb to counter his teleportation, then we get to work taking him down. And having two extra soldiers for this is quite nice, and I thought this part was pretty cool. Drifter hits a Null Lance right over the Priest's head in order to hit the Warlock. The Warlock does survive to his turn, our Psyops are really good at shutting down enemies, but they're not as good as some of the other classes when it comes to raw damage output. However, we have done enough damage that the Warlock hides in a bubble and sends some Spectral Stun Lancers to face us. He does send some regular Lancers as well, just to be annoying. And I realise there's actually a really good cheese strat that we could use here. See, the Warlock will only leave his bubble once all the Spectral guys are gone, and in his bubble, he's completely useless. So we can keep one of the Spectral Lancers alive and just keep using Stasis on it to shut it down every turn. This would leave us with ample time for our abilities like Null Lance and Soulfire to recharge. We can keep these guys in Stasis indefinitely if we wanted to. No reinforcements will ever come to bother us. Now I opted not to use this strategy as I don't think we need it. The Warlock is going down regardless, so we might as well save ourselves the time and just hit him now. I do stasis the last Spectral once though, just so we have a full turn to attack the Warlock before he can hit back. Now the Frost Bomb has of course worn off by now, so he is teleporting, but having abilities that are guaranteed to hit makes this far less of a problem than it has been on other runs. We destroy the sarcophagus and eliminate a captain who is spawned in. The other reinforcement is a berserker, which we easily disable with stasis. So then the warlock is back on 50 HP. Let's go. Now again, he's able to teleport, but that doesn't stop us this time either. Not only do we have attacks that are guaranteed to hit as long as we have line of sight, but we have two extra soldiers, so we can cover a lot of ground. There's really nowhere the Warlock can go where we cannot reach him. And now we can research the Warlock's rifle, which is going to be an awesome addition to our arsenal. This success does come with a price though. Look at our roster. They're pretty much enfeebled, so there's no way we can take on this retaliation mission. We have to skip it. Except, the thing is, I shouldn't have skipped it. I should have sent in one person and immediately evac'd out. See, the avatar progress seems to increase faster if you skip missions. So often just going into the mission and leaving right away can be the better option. And I honestly just forgot to do that here. But regardless, the avatar progress has now filled up again. 
I sense a recurring theme happening in this run. We have another facility available, so we set out to blow it sky high. Now I could do the psionic gate mission here to lower the avatar progress instead, but I figure there's a high chance someone will get injured from a burrowed chrysalid, so I think the facility is the safer bet. Especially when you look at our roster, we cannot handle any more injuries right now. There's no ruler on this mission which is good, but we're also fielding quite a few low level troops. We take it slow and steady, and with the help of our stun lancer guide, we make it out safely. If we had failed this mission, it would have been a campaign ender. So it's good that things went well. And now we get Red Devil back thanks to the recruitment pool double up glitch. She's been there since the start of the game, we just haven't had 25 supplies to spare until this point. And that's not an exaggeration. We are really desperate this run. We grab another recruit as well. Given how many unhealthy soldiers we have, I figure training an extra couple of recruits will help take the pressure off the top soldiers. We're strong enough now that we can afford to take a couple of low level people out on most missions. This will mean our top soldiers have more time to recover between outings. And now we're back to zero supplies from the council. Skipping that retaliation mission is still coming back to bite me. And then I go a little bit nuts with powered weapons. We've got the resistance card to build them instantly, and I really want a blaster launcher. Of course, after burning through four Illyrium cores, we don't get a single blaster launcher. Of course. Some more time passes, and I decide to hit the hunter. I dominate a shield bearer in the first pod, we have more uses of domination by this stage since we've trained more soldiers, so I figure we can afford to use one of them early on. And the benefit of the shielding may come in useful if we get any bad pot activations further down the line. And once again, we get this ridiculous glitch where a codex gets shot by Overwatch, spawns a clone, and then gets a full move hitting us with a Cybomb. Now this seems to happen almost exclusively on the Stronghold missions, and it's really annoying. Now it slows us down, and it does produce a fair bit of salt from yours truly, but we're not in any real danger. Having our guns jammed doesn't affect any of our psionic abilities, so it's really nothing more than an annoyance. We fight our way through the rest of the area and head down to the final Chosen, an Andromedon and Spectre are waiting for us, and the domination on the Andromedon actually works. I really wasn't expecting it to, but this is great. We now have one of these hulking monstrosities working for us. And hitting the hunter with an acid bomb is strangely satisfying. I usually spend these runs fearing getting hit by this attack, so delivering it to a chosen is pretty cool. And we actually take the hunter down in a single turn. We have a lot more Null Lancers now, so we can rely on those over Soulfire, so we're doing more damage. The reinforcements are a mech and a Spectre, I guess the Hunter doesn't want us bolstering our numbers with any mind controlling, but truth be told, between Null Lance ignoring armor, having Fuse, and now having two soldiers with blue screen rounds, robotic enemies aren't too much of a problem for us either. And of course, if we can't take one down right away, we've always got Stasis as a backup. We take an extra turn to destroy the sarcophagus, and in the meantime, two more Andromedons have spawned in. Normally this would be really bad, but Stasis will shut them down no worries. When we have a whole team of high level soldiers, Advent really can't do that much to stop us. And we actually score a domination on a second Andromedon. Now we have two of them. This is excellent. The Hunter goes into Overwatch when he returns, but a Soulfire is a guaranteed way to remove that. And then he goes down very easily. So that's it. The Chosen are done. Now the only thing that can really stop us is the Avatar progress. But we have access to plenty of story missions and facilities to deal with that if it becomes a problem again. However, after this mission, a familiar issue strikes us for the next round of Guerrilla Ops. The high level troops are tired from the Stronghold Assault, so we have to send out the lower level people. 
Now, even though they're lower level, this team does still hold their own, but it's taking time. We don't have the raw damage output from Null Lance and from dominating extra soldiers, so we are a bit slow. And this is a protect the device mission, and they're always really bad in the late game. In the early game, the enemies do a lot less damage, which gives you more time to get to the device, but not so when you're dealing with sectopods. So this forces me to push forward with Ratlord a bit sooner than I would otherwise like. We activate the sectopod, which is fine, but it blunders right into the device and destroys it instantly. So this results in immediate failure of the mission. And I remember this happened in my very first XCOM 2 campaign, all the way back in 2016. Yeah, six years later, I can still remember it. I don't remember much else of what happened in that campaign, but I remember that mission. I was pretty salty about it. And I'm salty about it here as well. I consider reloading, but ultimately this is not a glitch. It's just kind of bad game design, I guess. The sectopod is supposed to do environmental damage where it walks, which is what has destroyed our precious device. And really, I think protect the device missions just shouldn't spawn in the late game. They're just not balanced properly when you've got sectopods on the map. So instead, we just evac. Now, normally this would really annoy me, but we probably weren't going to win the mission anyway. Plus, the dark event is stiletto rounds on advent troops. It's a bad one to get, but it's not a terrible one. We can endure this, even if we really shouldn't have to. Then we have a council mission where we skulljack a codex. It's been ages since we've advanced the story, so we really should get onto that. I've just been too busy focusing on not losing. It's kind of nice that we can now start to think about actually winning. We frostbomb the avatar to prevent teleportation, and then we take it out. And our dominated stun lancer delivers the final blow, which is pretty cool. But interestingly, I think he misses every single attack he makes for the rest of the mission. I guess taking down a living god kind of traumatised him. Which is honestly fair enough, I think. We complete a gorilla op and pick up our first gatekeeper corpse. It's taken us until February of 2036 to get our hands on this thing. The campaign starts in March of 2035, so almost a full year. And we have fought plenty of gatekeepers by this point, but they've always been on missions that we've had to evac out of. Either because we failed the mission, or just because they were missions where evac was required to win the objective. Now that we finally have one, we can unlock tier 3 Psyamps. But we actually need a second gatekeeper to be able to build the Psyamps once they've been researched. Now I realise there's an easy way to get a second gatekeeper. We can just hit the Psionic Gate mission. However, before we can do that, we have a retaliation mission that we need to deal with. And this one we actually win, quite easily as well. That hasn't happened for a while. And the thing is, at this point, we just have enough high-level troops that we're really starting to dominate on the tactical layer. And all I can say is thank goodness, it's taken well and truly long enough to reach this point. And the best thing is, with another two faceless corpses, we can get a second Mimic Beacon. I complete a scanning reward for a heavy weapon, and we finally get the blaster launcher that I wanted. Alright, so let's get back to the Psionic Gate. Now I have got battle scanners for this one, but they're really a backup. The main strategy for dealing with the chrysalids that are burrowed underground is to find the biggest, meanest enemy we can and mind control it. This Andromedon will do perfectly. And once we've mind controlled it, we can buff this guy even further using a mind controlled shield bearer. And the plan is to just send the Andromedon out to tank the hits from the chrysalids. This thing seems to be immune to poison too. That makes sense, given it's basically in a giant metal hazmat suit. And it does a good job of being bait. So we make it to the gate, we end up with four chrysalids plus the gatekeeper all active at once. Now this may seem like a bad situation, but it's really not. And I figure this is a pretty good place to show you how powerful our psyops have become. So enjoy the show. Get up. 
up, nah, I ain't a quitter. Toss me the ball, I'm a really big hitter. Big picture, I'm a straight killer. Rice in the song to the highest bidder. Got juice, got gas, I'ma move fast. New shoes, new tracks, like who's that? I'm new, come back better than last. Yeah, it's a new me, never gonna look back. Never gonna look back. Cause damn, I was built to last. You move slow and I move fast. And that's facts. Only I can make a change. Slowly take a step today. I will never be the same. Cause that's what it takes. So there you have it, Advent were pretty much useless against us, and not having any Chosen to deal with on the mission obviously helps and makes things easier, and now we have our prize of the second Gatekeeper shell in our possession so we can finally upgrade our Siams to maximum level. Now this will increase the damage output of things like Null Lance, and it will also increase our chances of a successful mind control. We have a Protect the Device mission, and again, due to fatigue, I'm forced to send mostly low-level soldiers, and there's a Sector Pod. So yeah, same scenario as last time, and it obviously didn't end well for us then. Let's see if we can do better this time. Now things aren't looking too promising. The Sector Pod is really close to the device. Thankfully the device is inside a building, while the Sector Pod is outside. So right now the sector pod doesn't have line of sight on it, but this thing could easily walk through that wall and trample over all of our hopes and dreams at any moment. Now the lost are keeping it distracted for now, but I'm still really nervous here. I want to get over there quickly. So we go into the building above the sector pod with most of the team and drop down from the other side. Attacking the pod from this side causes the sector pod to move away from the device so it doesn't stomp right through it like last time. And we just keep shutting it down with stasis as necessary until we can finish it off. And the mission is actually a victory. So we did much better on round two. Then I figure we might as well hit the forge mission. I've been putting it off for too long. There's a stun lancer in the first pod and by this point, when I see advent troops, I don't even see enemies. I just see new recruits waiting to join our ranks. And the sector pod is again on our side of the bridge, but we obliterate it. We've been fighting sector pods for quite a while by this point. And something really weird happens with Red Devil, where I move her once, she reaches the spot I clicked on, then teleports back to where she was, and runs over to where I clicked on again. And by doing this, she uses up both of her action points. So, yeah, XCOM. I push on really recklessly as I'm getting impatient by this point, but even with a couple of bad pot activations, nothing can stand up to us. Advent really cannot touch us by this point, so this one's a win. And as soon as we're done with this mission, the Hunter UFO finds us. I had been evading it for quite a while by this point, but the time has come. It always does. So we load up our best troops, and off we go. And just like the Forge mission, it's really easy. The basic strategy is to dominate as many enemies as we can, and send them to attack the Disruptor, while our troops hang back at the Avenger. So we drop a blaster bomb onto the Disruptor, and then we send in a trio of a Codex, Archon, and Viper to finish it off. I feel like that's the beginning of a terrible joke. Codex, Archon, and Viper walk into a bar. Whatever, I'm not that funny. Let's just focus on the mission. So our troops start heading back to the Avenger, while the Advent forces destroy the Disruptor for us. And we win the mission in only five turns, which is pretty good. So if we wanted to, we could now hit the final missions and end the campaign, but there's one thing holding me back. We're still leveling up our soldiers in the Scilab. Yeah, it's taking a really long time, but I'd like to have nine max level Psyops 
three for the network tower, and six for the final mission. And Psy operatives can learn all the abilities in their skill tree without the training center. You just have to leave them in the Psy lab for long enough. And they also can't learn any hidden abilities through the training center. And that's why I haven't bothered building a training center in this run. We're not going to need the advantages from high level bonds either, so we skip it to save ourselves some time and some resources. Now while we wait, I'm literally skipping every mission that comes up, and every now and then when the avatar progress builds up, we hit a facility to reduce it again. We're really just waiting until we have those max level soldiers. Now one of these facilities that we hit is housing an alien ruler. We dominate everything we can, and our chance of mind controlling an Archon is now at 90% with our strongest soldiers. So much better than the 67% that it used to be. So we have a Codex, Archon, and a couple of Advent troops under our command when the Viper King shows up. I was actually hoping for the Archon King so we could get the Icarus armor, but this is fine too. And so behold why PsyOps make alien rulers trivial. Stasis shuts down the ruler for your entire turn. None of this reaction turns nonsense like the frost bomb. No, no, no. If you stasis a ruler, it will be unable to do anything for your entire turn. So we're able to hit the stasis and then move our Psy troopers out of line of sight. We can then hit with heavy weapons and null lances from our hidden position. We take the king down without it getting to attack a single time. Now I could go and do this to the other two rulers to get their armors as well, but I decide against it. It will just make the campaign go even longer, and the truth is I'm quite confident that we don't need the armors. At this point, Advent really isn't going to be able to stop us. So once we have 9 max level Psy operatives, we head out to the final 2 missions. And I'm expecting this to be little more than a victory lap to be honest. The early game was always going to be the worst part of this run. And I'm thankful to say we survived it and we're now ready to end things once and for all. One of the intel options for the network tower is Hypnography. This will lower the enemy's will by 50%, making our psionic attacks like Insanity and Domination much more likely to succeed. So in any other run, this option wouldn't be that useful, but for our psyops, it's the perfect buff to gain. And we can immediately see the effects with this Andromedon. Our Domination chance is 100%. Needless to say, we recruit him to the cause, but in doing so, we activate three pods, and each of them has a spectre. Spectres are immune to the likes of insanity and domination, so quite a few of our attacks won't really work on them. And they're probably the worst enemy that we could possibly spawn on this mission. And spoiler alert, over half the enemies on the map end up being spectres. Yeah, that sounds like XCOM, baby. We're able to stasis two of the spectres while dominating a codex as well. This leaves one spectre and one codex still active to attack us. I try an acid bomb on one of the spectres on the next turn, but they're actually immune. I never knew this, so that's something I've learned in this run. They're not immune to a regular grenade though, so it's really no problem. Now here, Mountain Man gets shadow bound by one of the remaining spectres. Now this in of itself isn't a problem, but then we randomly lose control of our dominated Andromedon. And I know what you're thinking, Mountain Man was the one in control of the Andromedon, right? Well no, he wasn't. He was the only soldier who hadn't yet used his domination ability. Now at first I thought this was a glitch, and so I actually reloaded the turn. But going back and looking at the footage as I wrote the script, I think I've worked out what actually happened. The Shadow Clone of Mountain Man has all of the original's abilities, including Solace, and that's what ended the mind control of the Andromedon. So it actually wasn't a glitch. If I had realized that at the time, I wouldn't have reloaded the turn, but it's too late now. So I guess this is technically breaking the Honest Man rules, 
even though I did it unintentionally. Now I don't think it's a big deal. We had the intel option that our soldiers are immune to the first two attacks they sustain, so the enemies wouldn't have been able to do much to us anyway, even with the Andromedon back on their side. And even if they could deliver extensive damage to us, our sustainability would activate and we'd still be okay. Now I do still have a save from just before the Network Tower mission, and I actually did consider replaying the mission just to prove I could do it without reloading, but I decided that in addition to being time consuming, it wouldn't really solve the problem as ultimately I'm still reloading the game. The only way to do it would be to go all the way back to the start of the campaign and begin from day one all over again. And that's just not gonna happen. Not over an issue this small. So I can understand if you think this run is now invalid as I have technically broken the rules, but I'm not too bothered by it. I don't think it would have changed the final outcome of the mission. It would have just made getting there a bit more difficult and time consuming. So after our reload and with our Andromedon still in our ranks, we push forward. The final pod is an Archon and two more Spectres. The Archon goes down easily enough and I send the Codex and Andromedon up to the roof so the Spectres focus on them and not on our Psy operatives. Now this buys us the time we need to get our troops onto the roof and take these annoying enemies down for good. And if you didn't know, Void Rift damages explosive containers in its AoE, so we inadvertently blow up half the roof. It was pretty cool. And now it's time for the final mission. And once again, we cannot use the commander's avatar in combat. I know some of you were looking forward to finally seeing him in action, but he's not a Psy operative. I mean, he does have psionic powers, but he isn't part of the Psy operative class. He's his own unique class, the avatar class. He will get a chance one day, it's just not today. The first pod of two berserkers goes down like it was nothing. Between Void Rift and Null Lance, we can deal with these high HP enemies quite easily. The next pod has a sector pod, and so it's a little bit harder to deal with. And when I say a little bit harder, I mean we have to use stasis a couple of times to eliminate the pod in two turns rather than one. It's still no challenge to us whatsoever. After that, some stun lances arrive, and they have very foolishly positioned themselves in a single line. Yeah, that wasn't too smart of them. And there's not really much to say about this first part of the mission. Even when we encounter the Gatekeeper, we take it down in two hits. A Null Lance and a blue screen round shot from the Warlock's rifle, it has no chance. The only real trick is to move through the map slowly, giving our abilities time to recharge between pods. As long as we do that, we're pretty much unstoppable. And even if we can't take something out, we can just spam stasis until we can take it out. We make it through the whole area without using a single domination. This one was as straightforward as I expected it to be. Six maxed out psionic soldiers are really just too much for Advent to be able to deal with. At least for the first part of the mission. The final chamber may be a bit more interesting. I take the usual strategy of breaking the team into threes and moving to each side of the room. We have the avatar down to 7 HP and Soulfire does a minimum of 7 damage. So this thing is gone. Or not? I have no idea how we only rolled a 6 damage here. Soulfire ignores armor, so it's not that. Now some people in the chat suggested that the avatars might have a psionic resistance and take less damage. Now even if this is true, the game should still tell us that. I mean, as an example, when we plan a melee attack on a sectoid, or any attack on a ruptured opponent, the game accounts for this and tells us in the target preview that we'll be delivering more damage. So even if the avatar does take reduced damage from Psy attacks, the game should still tell me about that. I really don't understand how this happened. Now it's not a big deal as we can still finish the avatar this turn, 
but it did annoy me. I don't feel so bad about reloading that Andromedon Solace turn anymore. With our two remaining moves, we dominate both Archons. The success rate was only 87%, so there was a chance of failure, but I figured they'd just go for Blazing Pinions, even if the domination didn't work, so the risk was pretty minimal towards us. Then Drifter uses a Void Rift to single-handedly eliminate a pod of three Chrysalids. Yeah, he's not playing around. We dominate a Viper and then destroy the other two that spawned in with it. Now these aren't the most powerful enemies that were mind controlling, Archons and Vipers, but that doesn't really matter. We just want as many troops as we can get, so taking control of the first ones we see is the best play. Even if they only deal minor damage to the Avatar, that may be all we need to get it to teleport out of a well defended position and into somewhere where we can hit it more easily. The second Avatar arrives, and I'd like to drop a blaster bomb on him and his retinue, but the problem is there's codexes there. I really don't want to spawn more of those things, so I opt for a different approach. And it's here that I actually learned the blaster bomb does have a range limit. I thought it could hit anywhere on the map, but it can't. Now the limit is gigantic, don't get me wrong, but it is there. So instead we opt for a shred storm cannon, deliberately avoiding the codexes. This way they won't make any clones. The avatar ends up teleporting into this distant corner of the chamber. I'm not even sure we have line of sight on it, let alone being able to attack it. But it's alright because we do have a plan. We end up daisy chaining a bonded extra action, plus an extra action from inspiration to get Icicle close enough to hit with the Null Lance. And that's avatar number two, also gone. The right side of the chamber is still a bit of a problem though. There's three sectoids, two codexes, and a faceless ready to attack. So by dominating one of the codexes, and with some help from our new Archon friends, we reduce those numbers to one sectoid, codex, and faceless each. Much less scary. But then Advent gets really serious by dropping three Andromedons in on us. We dominate one, and we stasis the other two. This was a really nasty pod, but it turned out to be no big deal. Our Psy operatives are just that powerful. Also, for those wondering about Codex clones when it's mind controlled, the Codex will not produce any clones while you have it mind controlled, no matter how much damage it takes. I guess it's the same as when the Codex is disoriented, they're both mental effects, so maybe any kind of mental effect stops the Codex from cloning. That's my best theory anyway, I am kind of sad that I can't make a clone army of Codexes though. That's a bummer. And now the final avatar is here. And I do something that really isn't a good strategy, but it may be the only time I get to do it. So we have to take the opportunity. Now, did you know the Viper's bind attack works on the avatar? Well, you do now. And yes, it will prevent the avatar from teleporting. And the reason this wasn't a good move strategically is because the majority of our troops are on the opposite side of the map. So we're a bit limited with the firepower we can unleash on this thing while it's stuck here. Allowing the avatar to teleport to the other side of the room probably would have been the smarter play. But worst case scenario, I can use a couple of inspires to get someone over to that side if we need them. And the fact that I'm just having fun with this mission at this stage should tell you how dominant our Psy operatives have become. I mean, we haven't used a single Mimic Beacon this whole mission. I'm not sure that's ever happened before. And so in humiliating fashion, getting crushed to death by one of its own soldiers, the third avatar is down and out. And with that, this run is over. All I can say is... Thank goodness. So yes, we can indeed beat XCOM 2 War of the Chosen using only Psy operatives. Ignoring the minor rule break of course. Now this run was pretty ridiculous, just as ridiculous as I expected it to be to be honest. 
We seemed doomed to defeat multiple times, but we somehow kept coming back from the brink. Now this was, without question, the most difficult challenge run that I've done to date. I mean, have a look at these stat screens as they come up. This campaign has finished in May of 2036. It took over a year of in-game time. And we had zero promotions. That probably doesn't happen too often. And I think the main thing that made this run as hard as it was, was actually the strategic layer. Now that may sound a bit weird, but hear me out. If we had been able to just hide away in the Avenger until our Psy troops were properly trained, we could have won this easily. But the Avatar progress forced us to keep heading out on missions that we really had no chance of winning. And as I said earlier, if we hadn't gotten good RNG with Covert Ops to reduce the Avatar project, I don't think we would have made it. We would have just kept losing regions and been unable to stay on top of the Avatar project. But we did stay on top of it, we were victorious, so let's put this one away. I hope that my suffering was worth it, and that this was an enjoyable video for you all. If you liked it, please rate, comment, and subscribe to the channel. I have some ideas for the next video, but it won't be a solo class run. I need a break from those for a little while. I know some of you want to see a rookies only class, but I really don't think I'll ever do that. It would just be all the worst parts of this video, but for an entire campaign. I do plan on trying some modded classes in the future, when I'm ready to come back to solo class runs. Alright, well that'll do me. I know this was a long one, so thanks for watching, and enjoy the rest of your day. Last. You move slow and I move fast And that's fact